Hi there, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, it's flatteringly gloomy in here, isn't it? I feel, I don't, yeah. But if you at all can't see, feel free to move slightly closer because I'm going to show some small things, but I've got a camera to hopefully communicate some of that. So I'm here to talk about materials and a few of their wondrous properties. But before I do, there's going to be a test. Um, no, not really. So um, my background is as an artist, maker, fiddler about a type. Um, I went to art college. But I also have a PhD in materials, but it's very uh, collaborative, a mixture of material science and uh, art, design, engineering, craft sort of thing. And um, I want to thought I'd better introduce my point of view on materials. Was that me? No. My point of yes, it was. <laughs> my point of view on materials um, to kick things off. So, coming from an arty, makey, hands-on background and encountering material scientists, I was sort of saying to them, well, what are materials for you? And most of the time, they'd sort of point you in the direction of the periodic table and start talking about fundamental combinations of matter, elements, stuff. But really, this is a map of ideas. This is a map of um, certain types of matter, elements, that combine together to form everything around us. Um, all the materials and matter in the known universe, in fact. But it's, it's about ideas. So copper element uh, 29, for example, its position on this map will tell you something about its properties of conductivity and its valencies and specific properties. But once you get a bit of copper, actually two bits of copper can be very different from each other. And once things enter the real world, they have different sort of properties. So the other thing that's really important in the kind of world of material science and engineering is notions of scale. Because what they do is they spend a lot of time like zoomed in looking at small amounts of stuff. And um, this sort of diagram explains essentially what I want to convey in this talk, which is the relationship between the very small and the very big and materials. On the left, we've got the animate side of things. This is biological living things, often like you and me. Um, but actually, culturally, this is a structure we're quite familiar with in the sense that when you zoom in on the back of the mouse you might find a little flea if you zoom in on the flea you'll find some hairs on the back of the flea go inside the flea and you'll find set, uh, tissues and cells and then structures inside cells and then keep going down and down and you find dna right and again culturally we're used to this idea that dna is this code that tells our cells to do things tells structures to form tells specific properties to occur so that micro atomic level actually has a macro effect. There's scales down there that talk to each other and produce things. So in my body, every cell in the DNA, there's a bit of code that says, when you're going to grow hair, grow really dark curly hair. So that's my bit of code. And then um, if you were to meet me, you might think, you know, that woman doesn't have a moustache, I'd hope. But if you then were to put me under the microscope, you might, we might start to see, oh, look. Little, little hairs, hang on. Where are they? There's one. No, where's it gone? Oh, maybe on my chin, maybe I've got some beard or something. Here we go. Yeah, we'll get there. Well, there's some hairs, there's some real hairs. I think, oh, here we are, look. ta -da. beard. Right. <laughs> so the point being, if you zoom in at certain magnifications, this is my new microscope. My other one's stronger and shows a really, really quite bushy, blonde, sort of hairy moustache, but this is um, an order of magnitude it's less focused, so I really had to hunt for some big ones then. Anyway. <laughs> um, oh, God, they're recording this, aren't they? Right. <clears throat> Zoe's moustache, the YouTube hit. Um, back to the slides. So you zoom in. Now look at me at the top. Now I've got a moustache. So you zoom in and you see things that you didn't see before, structures there that have specific effects and are caused by certain things that you can't see. So that's animate side. But the same is true of the inanimate side. In the world of like woods and metals and plastics and other stuff which we don't normally think of as animate with you know, having agency to them. Um, so, for example, if you took a metal of a spoon and you zoomed in um, closely enough, you'd actually see crystals. So all metals are made of crystals, and these crystals and their configuration and how they move and grow gives metals specific properties of, like, bendiness, right, ductility. Um, 
But, and the same, so all materials have this kind of structural link to them. So you might zoom in um, all the way down to the atomic level, but, and you'll find, oh, I need to do this, but I'll leave the microphone. Okay, so here we have atoms arranging into carbon nanotubes, single crystal transistor, crystals with inside metals, incredibly small cogs, um, that's the composite size of human hair, then tiny springs that you find within so, um, mobile phones and things, and then macro scale objects that we're all used to. But there's no upper limit on this. We could go all the way up to buildings, to planets, to universes, you know, material at different scales will always have different properties. But um, being from a kind of hands-on practical side, I was thinking, well, these material scientists are thinking of scales of space, but there's also scales of time, how you perceive materials changes through the lens of time. So here this is a me exploding a wine glass with sound and taking you know, a fraction of a second and ex essentially viewing it over the course, expanding out to last for about 20 seconds. So you then can perceive the behavior of that material. You begin to learn about how materials fail and are damaged due to the specific properties of the material or the shapes that they're formed into. But you can do the same the other way. You could time lapse record stuff and perceive it differently. So this is, it looks just like cake mix in a tub, but this is a, a viscous elastic material which we're all more commonly known as silly putty. So it used to come in an egg right when you're a kid. But this is, this took five hours, okay? And I filmed it over five hours and have sped it up to last again 20 seconds. So now it just looks like a liquid running. But when you see it in the flesh, as it were, it doesn't look like it's moving, but it's moving incredibly slowly. So that's scales of space and time. But um, I, in the journey of learning all this stuff, myself and my other collaborators, we started building a materials library. So at the Institute of Making, we have an extraordinary workshop that I like to think of as my dream garden shed. You know, it's got a bit of all the things that you just dearly love, and then finally we got them all in one space. But it also contains our materials library that we've spent 10 years building. This is just one wall of it. And it's a collection of stuff that's really there to inspire curiosity, wonder, delight, and surprise, but also provoke those questions and go, well, why is it doing that? And it really puts matter at the center of what is up making for us and that it's a relationship between material and process and tools, essentially. But there could be all sorts of different types of tools. So we've got a kiln and an oven and a food mixer, but also some 3D printers, some uh, laser cutters, some things that you'll see here, incredibly old-fashioned hand tools handed down through the ages from my grandfather to the, the latest Festool hand tools. Um, and we do all sorts of things there, from flint napping and um, pewter casting and... Uh, we had a blacksmith workshop to animatronics and Arduino stuff. So it spans a huge range of what is making. But at the heart of it is a relationship to materials. And so I wanted to show you a few more materials um, that hopefully will begin to, if I go back a slide, begin to really question what happens down the bottom here. Because when you're down at a certain scale, carbon atoms are carbon atoms. And maybe that it becomes a carbon-based life form, or maybe it becomes the graphite in a pencil. But it's just carbon at one level. And there's a lot of work being done that's really bleeding the boundaries between the animate and the inanimate. So I'm sure some of you have heard of biomimicry, where you take um, people engineered to make materials inspired by things in nature, like iridescent things from butterfly wings, or Velcro is a very famous one, right? So you take a structure and you sort of mimic it. So that was called biomimicry. And then it's now, people like to call it bio-inspired. So this is a bio-inspired material, um, which is called gecko tape, which on one side has teeny tiny microscopic hairs. So we might be able to see them. This is a test for the new microscope. Oh, they're so small, they're invisible. Okay, I'll come from the side. You can sort of see a little tiny bit of a structure. Is it coming up on the screen? There's sort of a grid. Can you see it's got a, it looks, one minute, okay, faster. So that's, this is incredibly sticky, basically, but it's not sticky in the classic sense, like tape, it needs very smooth surfaces, and then it's very hard to remove, like geckos climbing up walls. But that's my biomimicry. Um, but I kind of like to coin a new term, which is biocooperation. So there's a whole new realm of materials which are biocooperative. This being one, this is self-healing concrete that has bacteria inside it that when they get wet, 
come alive, start eating some food that's been left in there, and then they poo out a material which heals up cracks in concrete. So if a crack forms, moisture get in, bacteria get to work, go to the loo, as it were, fill up the gap, heal the concrete. Next one, bioscaffold. So this is a material which is designed to be implanted into the human body and then is impregnated with, you know, with stem cells and a protein. And when it's in your body, it acts as a sort of food and a catalyst for the growth of new bone. And your bone will grow onto it. But not only that, it starts to eat the material itself. So let's say over a period of time, let's say two years, you don't have an implant anymore. You just have your own bone. So it's designed to become animate. It's designed to disappear and really is that sort of bridging the gap between the animate and inanimate. No time left. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so I, I can take some questions with this roving mic, but the first one might be, what have you got there, isn't it? Is it? No. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? I should give you a chance. Is this on? Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Which one would you like to know about first? This one? So this is some aerogel, of the picture of which you can see here. And this material is um, dropped on the floor. Oh my God. <laughs> this material is designed by NASA for catching stardust. So, this is, at the time it was made, it was the lightest solid in the world. So, it's 99.8% air. So, only 0.2 of it is like the stuff. And the stuff in this case is a silica. So, it's a kind of glass. But it's, it's imagine it's like a foam. So, you can sort of see it there. But when in the right angle of light, it's, it is blue. Um, and the blueness is for the same reasons that the sky is blue. So it's essentially about the index of which light is scattered as it passes through the material. It's not a pigment. It's not blue like these chairs are blue because it's absorbing certain wavelengths and reflecting other. This is about how light is scattered as it passes through it. Like, that's why the sky is blue. So it's scattered by these microscopic pores. It's like, imagine a meringue, um, teeny tiny pores, and that's what gives it this amazing lightness, but also relative strength. Um, so that's some aerogel given to us by NASA. Uh, what's it good for? So Na NASA used it to catch stardust. They took it up in um, a satellite, I think, and then they s stuck it out behind a comet. And all these bits of dust that were flying off the comet lodged it. Well, what happens is when things hit things in space, they're going incredibly fast, and you had two options. The dust will either hit something and the dust explodes, or the dust damages the thing. And so in this case, because you've got those tiny um, holes and those pores, each one can act like a crumple zone, and that each individual pore can explode and kind of catch that dust, but it doesn't damage the rest of the material, so the homogeneity of the material isn't affected by that one bit. So then these dust particles could be brought down to earth and examined. Um, but now it's really thermally insensitive, so people are looking at using it in architectural insulation, but it's still quite expensive. But you know, there's also now flexible aerogels being developed, other types of aerogels around. I mean, I like to think omelettes are kind of egg aerogel as well. Foam, started liquid, becomes solid. Um, yeah. Any other aerogel-related comments? Any other questions? Oh, I'm supposed to be doing this, aren't I? Okay, that question was, what, is the institute, what does the Institute of Making do? Good question. So we are a cross-faculty institute at UCL, which means we're open for any member of staff or student at UCL. You could be a cleaner, you could be a professor or an undergrad. You're welcome to become a member, and we provide the members with a space to make in, essentially. So, as I said earlier, it's like dream garden shed time. There's facilities to make, but there's also access to the materials. And we also run events, curate exhibitions, um, stage masterclasses, and some of those things are more public. So we do once a month public open days, and we've done a lot of public stuff, um, ranging from things at other people's institutions, like at the Tate or the V&A, um, and then other things in our own space. But we also do research, so we're interested in what we call the sensor aesthetic properties of materials, so what are the physical quantifiable science about Something, ugh, that, ugh, that, a lick, you know what I mean? Why does that taste like that? You know, sort of experiential things. Um, what's the science behind those? We're kind of interested in that. We make objects and do kind of design 
projects. We do all sorts of things, things that we want to do, really, that's <laughs> around materials and making. Um, yes? Are we open to alumni as well? Are we open to alumni as well? I'm not at the moment, mainly because we have enough. Dem we have so much demand from the current student and staff body that this is just our first year. I mean, we've the institute making has existed before, but this space we've suddenly opened has only been open three months. So we aimed for a thousand members in the first year, and we are on 950 or something at the moment in, th in three months. So we're a bit like you know one step at a time. Um, but we know that there is going to be some demand from alumni, some demand from the public, and it's just to be a question of when we get ourselves sort of more stable and assessing it, we'll see how we can make that possible. Okay, Madam, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you.